Sinead O'Connor Empath or Narcissist Part 13 Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor and we're going to hear more from people with their views about Sinead O'Connor as part of understanding more about the person that she was to help us make a determination as to whether she was a narcissist, whether she was an empath, whether she was a normal or that it was somebody who was narcissistic but not a narcissist. Steve Wickham, the violinist for the Water Boys, also played with O'Connor. He explained that Sinead O'Connor's voice is one of the most extraordinary you will ever hear, whether in full flight as a singer or full flight as a woman, mother, activist, writer and friend. Sinead was a keener, crying for Ireland and our woes, our warrior queen. She was intensely spiritual and under the armour was a kind, generous and sweet woman. I first met Sinead when she was still in school in the early 80s. She came along to Eamon Andrew's recording studio in Dublin to make a demo of her song Take My Hand with our band Into An Hour. She loved being part of it all. She walked in carrying her canvas school bag. I remember her hero Kate Bush's name carefully etched in marker on it. Over the years, we became good friends and she moved into a flat nearby in Rathmines. I produced the demo for her first band, Tom Tom Makuta, and she asked that I play on her demos in London for her first solo record. This led to us writing a song together for her debut album, The Lion and the Cobra, called Just Like You Said It Would Be. We spent the day writing it in an underground cellar by the Thames and then back to her flat for a curry and a laugh. She was funny, clever and beautiful. I'm in tears remembering her, and my heart goes out to Johnny and all her lovely children. Affectionate words there from Steve Wickham, recalling an individual who was clearly viewed by him as kind and generous. Might he just have experienced the veneer and the facade? Possibly. Or was that actually the case, that she was genuinely a kind and generous woman? Next, there are words from HIV Island. As her global smash hit, Nothing Compares to You, reached number one on the UK charts in February 1990, Sinead appeared on what was and remains Ireland's biggest television talk show, RTE's The Late Late Show. Wearing a Dublin AIDS Alliance t-shirt, she used her platform to highlight the stigma facing people living with HIV. Now, is this a narcissist commandeering somebody else's cause for the purposes of facade management? Well, possibly. But to suggest that Sinead O'Connor operated a facade wouldn't, on the evidence that we've heard so far, really be correct. Uh, she would be, as it's commonly described, call a spade a spade. She would speak out and call it as it is, not caring for who she offended, which might be seen as an absence of emotional empathy, or might just simply be that she felt so passionately about certain subjects that she didn't care that it offended people because she viewed the subject as more important than people's feelings. Accordingly, to suggest that she was involved for a facade doesn't really necessarily ring true. Or perhaps it was such that she was the type of narcissist that would alternate in terms of utilising a facade but also speaking her mind, not caring where it offended on certain occasions. Perhaps moving her more to the status of an aware narcissist than one that would utilise a facade all of the time in public that would be mid-range. This recollection continues by explaining that Dublin AIDS Alliance, now the charity HIV Island, was then a collective of community and voluntary organisations working with and advocating for people living with HIV and AIDS. Sinead's decision to wear the t-shirt, which she probably considered a small gesture of solidarity, had a far-reaching impact on the community of people living with HIV in Ireland. HIV Ireland's community support manager, Dr Erin Nugent, says... Many people living with HIV recall, years later, the profound impact of seeing Sinead in the T-shirt and listening to her advocating for people living with HIV and AIDS who felt judged, marginalised and frightened. Sinead's decision to use her platform to highlight such a merciless inequality was a groundbreaking moment in the fight against HIV-related stigma in Ireland, and she continued to do that throughout her career. Again, that would suggest the presence of emotional empathy for to her behave in that way, or a very clever facade. 
but also note the consistency that she carried it on throughout her career. We know, in relation to another prominent narcissist, that she only banned wagons, but it doesn't appear that O'Connor does this. Is this because it is genuine and authentic with regard to her emotional empathy, or might it be that as an aware narcissist she is able to maintain that consistency to make it look like she cares, rather than the more superficial approach adopted by those such as Harry's wife? We will find out, of course, in due course. In 2007, she participated in HIV Island's Stamp Out Stigma campaign, reading to camera the words of an African woman living with HIV. Stephen O'Hare, executive director of HIV Island, says she used her voice simply as a means to amplify the voice a marginalised woman of colour living with HIV in a way that was humble and unique to Sinead. Next, it's Vivian Goldman, who's a journalist, and she interviewed O'Connor for Rolling Stone in 1997. My intention is to live a long life and keep diaries this time, so I won't forget. O'Connor stated poignantly in her typically revealing 2021 memoir, Rememberings. Her creativity was mesmerising, all the more haunting for being haunted. Was there ever a more naked, vulnerable and still innately political artist? A true she-punk, her mission scoffed at fame, Counterintuitive to the general thrust of the music industry, she did everything, the music, the family, the life choices, her own way. This suggestion that she scoffed at fame might also again suggest that she wasn't a narcissist, that she eschewed having that fame. It was more about the music and the message rather than the adulation. Indeed, it would possibly be the case that someone who spoke her mind so often and didn't care if she alienated certain people was not interested in the receipt of fuel. Or might it be that she was a highly provocative narcissist that reveled in the reactions to her controversy? It seemed as if in her combat with the patriarchy and the world's corruption, she reportedly performed Easter by serially rising in new spiritual guises, embracing Irish goddess worship, the priesthood, Rastafarianism, and ultimately Islam. The title of her 1990 album, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, however, reads quintessentially Buddhist, and remarkably her memoir evidences compassion even for her scary mother, who brutalised her in several ways. No help with Sinead's later diagnoses, including post-traumatic stress disorder. One can only wonder, did Sinead manage to find that same compassion for herself? Yet, there was a toughness within. In a 1997 interview, I asked if she had advice for female musicians starting out. Her reply, learn how to say no straight off. You don't have to look like the makeup artist wants, trust your instincts. You will have to sever professional relationships with people, and you've got to learn not to feel like a bastard. At the end of the day, it's your name on the thing, and it's down to you. Sound advice, it would appear. Is this a narcissist asserting control, or is this just somebody who is able to, rec to assert her own boundaries? A final observation related to her and religion. Religion is often thought about as discrete traditions, institutions that someone is either inside or outside, but on the ground it's rarely that simple. The Catholic Church had a strong hold on Irish society as O'Connor was growing up, a theocracy, she called it, in interviews and in her memoir. And for many years, she called for more accountability for the clerical abuse crisis. But she was also open in her love of other aspects of the faith, albeit often in unorthodox ways. She had a tattoo of Jesus on her chest and continued to critique the church while appearing on television with a priest's collar. Ten years after her Saturday Night Live performance, O'Connor took courses at a seminary in Dublin with a Catholic Dominican priest, Reverend Wilfred Harrington. Together, they read the prophets of the Hebrew Bible and the Psalms, sacred scriptures in which God's voice comes through in darker, moodier, more human forms. Inspired by her teacher, she made the gorgeous album, Theology, dedicated to him. The album is a mix of some of her own songs, Inspired by the Hebrew Bible, like If You Had a Vineyard, inspired by the book of Isaiah, and Watcher of Men, which draws from the biblical story of Job, 
and other stories that essentially are sung versions of her favourite psalms. In a 2007 interview with Fordham University's WFUV radio station, O'Connor said that she was hoping the album could show God to people when religion itself had blocked their access to God. It was a kind of rescuing God from religion, to lift God out of religion. Rather than preaching or writing, music is the little way that I do it, she added. I say that as someone who has a lot of love for religion. To many horrified Catholics, O'Connor's SNL appearance and her many other criticisms of the church were blasphemous, or at best, just throwing stones from outside the church for attention. Other fans, however, saw it as a prophetic condemnation. It was not just a critique of child abuse, but of church officials' professed compassion for children, sanctimonious pieties as they covered up the abuse. In calling this out and so much more, O'Connor was often seen as disturbing. Not just the photo of the Pope incident, but her androgyny, her shaved head, her openness around her own struggles with mental illness. But for many admirers, as the documentary Nothing Compares made clear, all this showed that she was free and like the prophets of old, unashamed and unafraid to provoke. There you have a series of recollections about Sinead O'Connor, much of which is positive, but also does demonstrate the downside of some of her behaviours as well. It all affords us a greater look at who she was. Next we're going to consider her relationship with her children before we then move on to looking at the issue of her mental health and then the conclusion to this analysis of Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> 